Okay, um, we're very lucky tonight to have Charlie Robertson, who is um, one of the leading sort of investors in Africa, an analyst of um, financial markets in Africa. He's a partner at FIM. And we're lucky to have him. He's won several accolades and awards as a pioneering investor in making Africa a serious place to think about for foreign investors. Um, he's also someone that, in his book, Time Traveling, the, the Time Traveling Economist, I think it's a really important book, and Charlie's going to discuss what the book is about. It's important because it tries to build, tries to do two things that are quite important. It tries to connect dots of disparate fields. So he combines dynamics of demography and fertility with electricity provision and education, fields that are often siloed, as, develop, as a lot of things in development are siloed. He tries to build theories by synthesizing the insights and the patterns from these fields to explain the prospects of development within Africa. The other thing about this book that's quite important is that he pays a lot of attention to variation. There's a lot of unilinear theories in development about everything's all good, all bad, and so on. Charlie's book helps us look at why is Morocco become a more exciting investment destination than it used to be? Why is Kenya more exciting than some other places? And so looking and exploring and explaining variation is a very welcome um, and, and building it through models and thinking through the logic of how these patterns interact. I think is a very welcome thing for policymakers, not just financial analysts and economists, but just policymakers generally, because variability and variation is where we th think most precisely and rigorously about what policies are likely to work and why. So I'm going to hand over to Charlie now, um, and um, I urge everyone to, to read this book. It's fantastic. Uh, thank you very, very much for, um, for coming. Um, just to to explain, so th there's three kind of key themes I'm going to talk about. One is education, one's electricity, and one's fertility. And um, it, it's a bit like when my wife and I go to a drinks party. Mm -hmm. uh, the first drink, I'm really good, I'm really fun, people like me. Uh, and that's like the first chapter, and you all nod your heads on the education and say, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. By the second drink, it gets potentially boring, but, but still. And then by the third drink, my wife's head in hand saying, oh, please, just let him stop talking. That, that fertility issue is, is the one that's often very controversial. Um, this all started, if I can get this to, um, to work. Um, well, this is a graph done by an engineer colleague of mine. Super smart, uh, indecipherable, except to him. Um, what it's trying to show is GDP per capita in 1960, GDP per person in 2019, and uh, its baseline is America. So if you are uh, below the baseline, you've, you've fallen back relative to America in 60 years. If you're above the line, you've got closer to America. So Korea, famous example, where's 7% of American per capita GDP in 1960, and it's now 64%. It's done incredibly well. Um, people claim that America is this dynamic free market economy, so much better than uh, high tax France, in fact, over 60 years, there's no difference between how the two have performed in 60 years. But there is a big problem with countries like Ghana, uh, which is a wonderful place to go, but was 20% of America's per capita GDP in 1916 is now seven. So really what I'm trying to get at is why have we seen that, that change? Um, and how do you get closer to America? And the way you get closer to America is obviously to be one of the few countries that have achieved six to seven, five to six percent growth per person. Um, most countries only get one to two. But as America gets one to two per person, you need to be doing much better. So how can we be like those countries and not be falling back like, like too many in, in Africa? And I end up saying it's to do with education, electricity and fertility. Five countries this doesn't work for. So please don't ask me questions about South Africa, Argentina, Venezuela, but Jonathan knows all about Venezuela, um, Lebanon and Sri Lanka. But I think in Lebanon and Sri Lanka, it's because of the wars that they had for 30 years. So just when they should have been booming, wars wiped out 30 of their best years. For the rest of the world, 
this works. And I think it works a lot better than why nations fail, which is now an embarrassing slide to present because these guys just won a Nobel Prize. And <laughs> I haven't yet won one, but with your support. Um, so they said it's all about governance. And if you've got good governance, you succeed. And when I was writing the book, four Korean presidents are in jail for corruption. This is one of the most successful economic development models we've ever seen. And yet at the end of that, they're jailing four presidents. So the argument that corruption is a terrible problem, or which it is, but it stops development, just doesn't seem to me to hold water. What this is showing you is that this is Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. Everybody has a poor score until you get to about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars per capita GDP. Because down here, there's only three million Nigerians pay income tax. If you don't pay tax, yes, you care that the government's stealing money, but you don't care as much as if they're stealing your money out of your pocket. So when you are low income, you're not paying much tax. When you're up here, you are paying tax and you really do, do begin to care. And at that point, you start to jail your presidents. So I would love to say it really matters that we get rid of corruption, we have good governance. I don't think it does. What does seem to matter is education. And this came about from a report I was asked to do in 2017 saying, what have the Romans ever done for us? To the life of Brian reference for anyone who hasn't seen the film. Um, it was a question of what the Bolsheviks ever done for us. And I said, it's got to be education, right? If you look at education 20 years before the Bolshevik Revolution, the highest, most literate part of the Russian Empire was Finland, followed by Estonia, followed by Lithuania, settled down to Poland, and Moscow and St. Petersburg, who were best within what is Russia today. And the per capita GDP numbers in 2017 were exactly in line with the education numbers from 120 years before, which was surprising, I thought until I found a book by a woman called Mary Jean Bowman in the LSE Library. I've gone there to try and find out if robots are gonna take our jobs. If you wanna update that, it's now, is AI gonna take our jobs? There's always something about, is the new technology gonna take our jobs? And I found out, no, it's, they're not. Well, they are gonna take our jobs, we just have to find new jobs, different jobs. We don't know what they are yet, but we will be fine. Um, what, what I found on a dusty shelf from this woman in the 60s was her theory that unless you have 40% adult literacy, you can not grow sustainably. You need 70 to 80% adult literacy to industrialize. So I'll run those numbers today and see if that's still true, this weird 1960s theory that no one's ever talked about. And it was, it is. If you look at emerging markets, these are emerging markets, um, green is good, green is over 70%. Red is you can't grow sustainably. Yellow is like in between. The reason we didn't buy anything made in China in the 1980s was because in the 1980s, Chinese literacy was only 66%. They were not literate enough as a country to make anything that anyone wanted. 1990, that changed, and suddenly they can produce goods. The reason India didn't make any goods until five years ago, exaggerate a little, is that they didn't have the literacy rate to industrialize. They're now 74%. So made in India, Modi's new program can happen. iPhones can now be made in India when 15 years ago, not possible. And if I was to look at, um, some of the richest emerging markets today, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, were the countries that had the highest literacy 100 years ago. Poland was better than Greece 100 years ago, and it's about to overtake Greece, or it's even overtaken Greece already now. So education is hugely important. We see that in emerging markets. And when we look at Africa, we can see why when decolonization happened in 1960, there wasn't a chance in hell that these countries could grow sustainably. This wasn't going to happen. 
Um, the only positive, there is no positive actually. I mean, the, the story I then showed to kids in sixth form colleges is I say, right, if I give you 1950 adult literacy rates for 25 African countries, can you tell me which is the richest of those 25 countries today? The 16 year old economic students, geography students will put their hands up and say, Mauritius. And I'll say, that's absolutely right. It's only one country richer. It's not on my chart, Seychelles, they're uh, 74%. So the literacy story is absolutely fundamental. And the fantastic news is that so many countries are now in the 70 to 80%. So Africa is going to have a fantastic 21st century. Why isn't it happening already is the next question. Oh, yeah, there you go. Seychelles, the capital GDP, $21,000. Mauritius next at $12,000. So the education story, we just have to take as an absolute baseline. Quick look at map of Africa. Every box here is a million people. Green is good. Dark green is really good. Southern Nigeria, phenomenal. Northern Nigeria can't grow sustainably. I went to Africa Command in 2018, and I said, the reason you're going to have coups and civil war and insurrection across the Sahel for the next 20 years guaranteed is because the education levels are too low. And the response of Africa Command was, so we can basically pull some troops out there because there's really not no point in us putting the effort in. The other really interesting thing, there was an American officer who said, so you're telling me, I can't do a very good American accent. <laughs> you're telling me that if we hadn't spent a trillion dollars bombing Afghanistan, we put a trillion dollars into educating Afghanistan, it'd be a completely different story. It's absolutely right. 960 billion bombing, I think it's 20 billion educating, was not the right ratio. So again, it's telling you that the most people in Africa now are now in a position to industrialize, take off. Wonderful. And the reason we haven't seen that take off yet is because we haven't had it yet. So this is exports per person in constant dollars. And I find it amazing that there's a country like uh, Pakistan, which has actually shown no growth in exports per person in 70 years. And that's true of Burundi, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya, it's, it's, it's kind of phenomenal. Countries that have done well, places like Morocco, starting to pick up over the last 20 years. Tunisia did actually really well. Um, we're gonna come back to some of those in a minute. So you've got your literate population. What do they need? You, you don't employ illiterate people in factories, by the way. Um, it's a famous economist called Adam Smith. who wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations 250 years ago. He didn't know about literacy. He took it for granted. Everyone was literate in Scotland in 1750. Uh, some economists, even today, some famous development economists still think all you need to work in a factory is dexterous hands. That was the word used by Adam Smith. And um, you actually do need to be able to read or write when the goods come down the conveyor belt, it goes into the box of America or the box called Europe. And I learned that from a Levi's factory manager you know, who used to be in Sri Lanka and Philippines. A guy from Tanzania flew up to this conference FD Africa yesterday and he said, that, that what you're saying there about literacy in factories is so important. So literacy is absolutely fundamental. But the next thing you need is power. Otherwise, your factory doesn't work. So who's got power? Green is good. Gray is like inadequate amount of power. And this is Africa's problem. A lack of power. Southern Africa is all right. Despite the power cut stories you read about South Africa, it's all right. It still produce cars. North Africa is great. Too many other people are stuck. So I was in Kenya a few years ago, and I said to the Kenyans, you just need to build more power. Do what the Chinese did. Just build more power. And they said, we have a problem. And the problem is interest rates. If you're going to build a five, ten billion dollar electricity system, and your discount rate, your interest rate is ten percent, the amount of interest you're paying on that power grid 
is so high that if the factories don't come, you're bankrupt. If you've got interest rates at 3%, it doesn't matter if the factories don't come and start paying for your power because your interest rates are so low, you can carry the cost of the, the thing. And this is true of coal or gas or nuclear or wind in Europe or Japan. Doesn't matter what sector, doesn't matter what country, it's all about interest rates. And as a markets guy, we care a lot about interest rates. Then makes the question of why are interest rates so high in Africa? And what I heard this week at the FT Africa conference is, is because people have got a risk. I don't understand Africa. They misprice risk in Africa. But this includes the locals. Local currency interest rates are 10 to 15% across countries like Nigeria or Angola or Kenya. And it's not an African story, because Pakistan's got the same problem. And it's not an African story, because if you're Mauritius or Morocco, you're paying 2% interest rates. Why? And this is what, honestly, never, ever, ever gets asked at conferences. It's why I'm here now, because I want you to think about why are these African countries, actually Asian countries, or, or is this nothing to do with continental space? The weird answer is, is fertility. This is the third drink, remember, from my talk. <laughs> if you've got six kids or more like Niger, you have no deposits in the banking system because you've got no money on a Friday night to put into a bank. And this was true of my great grandparents when they had six or seven kids. And this is not true when you have two to three kids. When you have two to three kids, your bank deposits rocket to 60% of GDP on average. And that is Bangladesh, and it's India, it's Morocco, it's Indonesia. The successful stories of today are the countries with low interest rates. It really is, I would say, as simple as that. This is a log scale. So actually, I'm... I'm I'm concealing just what a difference there is between countries with a fertility rate above four. There isn't a single one where your bank deposits are above 50% of GDP. You cannot have savings in your banking system if you've got high fertility. So we have a little look at a map of Africa and who's got low fertility. It's South Africa, Soto, Botswana. Morocco, Tunisia, and, and Mauritius down here, the first, one of the first countries to industrialize in Africa. And in Asia, everybody has got a fertility rate below three, except for Afghanistan and Pakistan. So countries like Nigeria, Congo, Angola have actually got fertility rates so high, like above five, but they're not going to get to low interest rates and high growth for decades. And we know this because demographics is pretty well baked in. And if you've got no deposits, you can't lend. If there's no deposits in the banking system, why do deposits, why do bank lending, why is bank lending stuck at the same level in Nigeria for the last 15 years? Why is bank lending stuck in Zambia at the same level for 15 years? Because there's no deposits in the banking system. And there's not going to be until you become low fertility. And when you become low fertility, what happens to Morocco? Who's been to Morocco in this room? Any problems with electricity? No. <laughs> uh, any problems with electricity? You look at the infrastructure, you look at the triple lane highways, you look at the beautiful airports, and you say, this is a country that's got its infrastructure right. Well, it's because the fertility rate dropped below three in 1999. Just an aside, what happens when you've got good educated people, which is what we've got on the continent now, but no savings to give them jobs? They leave. And that was the Europeans, by the way, in the 19th century. The Europeans had the slowest industrial revolution the world's ever seen. Britain led that. Britain had absolutely the slowest. And the Brits left in their droves to go to America or South Africa or anywhere. Uh, and then we had the Irish, my grandmother, and all of her family coming over to try and get jobs in lower fertility England, 
rather than high fertility Ireland, Turkey to Germany, Morocco to Netherlands, and then it was Philippines to Hong Kong, and now today it's Ugandans to Dubai and Nigerians to Canada. And this is going to carry on for decades until the fertility rates fall. So when are they going to fall? When do we get the takeoff? Mauritius, 1979. This was a, a country two Nobel Prize winners said was a disaster. It was never going to take off. They said that in the 60s. But then the fertility rate fell, boom time. Longest growth of any country on the planet ever, Mauritius. I think until COVID. Morocco, 1999. Cars are now rolling off the production line in Morocco. They export more cars per person in Morocco than they do in France. Well, Egypt just got there, 2019. The UN's just changed its numbers. It was saying this is going to be a 2025 to 29 story, and that's in my book. The UN said, actually, it's already changed. Kenya, five years' time. It's all coming good. Mali, 2058. Disaster. There's going to be no growth. There will be absolute poverty in Mali for another 35 years, unless something changes. So you can look, kind of track when countries drop below that free line, when bank deposits rise, interest rates fall, investment picks up, it's an amazing story, and we can track exactly when it's going to take off where we go. This is the good news. So what can you do to try and speed this up a bit? And one of the best things you can do is stop kids dying. I got a little concerned about COVID, not that concerned because I'm a data nerd and I knew that my odds were pretty good. Um, my odds of dying were something under 1% at my age, uh, unvaccinated. In Nigeria, I've got a 10% chance of dying by being born. Before the age of five, 10% chance of dying. And if you've got a 10% chance of dying before the age of five, your parents have five to six kids, which is what my great great grandparents did. And two of them died kids. So child mortality would be a really good thing to address, and it's not a money problem. I pick on Nigeria because I love Lagos and I go there a lot, uh, but they're here 11%, 10 or 11% of kids dying under the age of five, 3% in Venezuela, 5% in Ghana, same capita GDP. This isn't a money problem. It shouldn't be that expensive to sort out. And the other thing, obviously, you do is you educate girls. When they're having the first kid at 14 in Niger, second kid at 17, third kid at 19, you've already got a massively higher fertility rate than if your first kid is at 19. So educating girls, child mortality, government campaigns saying, actually, having loads of kids isn't good anymore. It used to be good when you were a farmer. You're going to go to the knowledge economy. You want smaller, fewer families. The other thing that gets missed uh, is, is we can then forecast growth on the share of the population that are kids or, or adults. So when Asia was a disaster for economists, in 1970, we had the Hindu rate of growth. India was never going to grow. We had the Chinese Cultural Revolution, disaster. Southeast Asia War, Half the population of Asia were kids. And kids shouldn't be working and growing your economy. They should be at school. Today, 70% of the population in Asia are adults, working age adults. This is great. These are the people who should be working. So growth is going to be higher in countries where more people are adults than where they're kids. And that hasn't changed yet for, for Africa overall. To put it really simply, Take 10 sampled people in China, Greece, or Ghana. Who's got the least number of working age adults? Weirdly, it's Ghana. And of those five out of 10 kids, five out of 10 people who are working age adults, at least one or two is going to be looking after the kids. While in China, actually, you're right. Even Greece, such an old country, is in a slightly stronger position. So then you just say, what was per capita growth? Let's go back to per capita growth. Because what we want is that four, five, six percent per capita growth, right? To converge with America or France. To get that, we want two and a half working age adults per kid or pensioner. You want a high proportion of the working age population 
if we are where Africa is in 1960, 1 1.2, you're going to grow at one and a half percent a year. That doesn't convert with America. 1990, 1.1. 1 .1. We actually went down. Today, 1.3. We're here. It's the yellow line which we should be paying attention to. Where we want to be is up here. So we just know that you can't get a very, very high growth um, on average. On average. So we can then go through countries and say who's taking off, who's getting worse, who's whatever. And this is like uh, Vietnam. Vietnam was doing, was, is doing great. This is the share of working age adults to kids or pensioners. Um, and, and they're in a great position. They're like Korea, like 20 years after. Vietnam's fantastic. You want to make a career somewhere, just go to Vietnam. Great. 30 years is going to be fantastic. Philippines, amazing as well. Philippines is doing great. They're going to do fantastic. It, it took a long time because they had high fertility, but they started to take off about now. This is when it gets really good for Philippines. Uh, Indonesia, much better than the situation. Saudi, incredible. Saudi, booming. Uh, the conference this, this last week in, uh, in Saudi. And then you know, just to make sure that you do go to all of these other more interesting countries than stay in Europe, Europe is looking pretty bad. And the only good thing I can say is the French and the Germans are in a worse position than the Brits and the Americans. But this is only because the Brits and the Americans love immigration. And that's why we said no to Brexit. We said no to Trump. Because we love immigration because it gives us the better demographics. But uh, anyway, it's sad. Singapore, Hong Kong. Hong Kong is like doomed. Doomed. And Japan, what happens when you get too old? It's not kids anymore, it's pensioners. Japan is it's collapsing. We're at 1% growth of the capture in Japan. But, uh, and, and for Africa, it's just, it's just not going to happen for, for, for ages. The, the boom stories should be Morocco and Egypt. They're the good ones. And Goda and Congo are so far away because they're not doing enough on female education. They're not doing enough on child mortality. Um, so I go and tell investors... You want to go to countries where we're in green. That's the easy place to make money. This is the interesting place to invest. That's the easy place to invest. Go and work in India, 30 years of boom, it'll be fine. But not much fun. So to simplify this, really down, narrow it down to the very simplest number, because you hear this all the time. What age do you want your country to be? 25, roughly, to about 35 is when you start to have a bit of money. If you're 18, you've got no money. At least if my daughter said it to go by, you've got no money. And you've got lots of desires. You want this, you want that. You will borrow money to do it, but you, you, you haven't actually got any cash to consume yourself. So the next time you hear a leader turn around and say, we're a young country, we've got an average age of 18, you go, okay. you've got a lot of issues and a lot of problems. It doesn't mean you're not going to get growth, but all the growth of 4 or 5%, which the model kind of implies, it's coming from population growth. It's not coming from the gaps of GDP growth. So Nestle made a big mistake about seven years ago. They said, we're going to go into Africa because Africa's growth is the same as India's. True. But India's growth is per capita GDP growth and a little bit of population. While Africa's is population with only a little per capita GDP. So the middle class is doubling or trebling in India in the same period it's taking, traveling or quadrupling, in the same period it's taking to double in, 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 in too many countries in Africa at the moment. And then there's this view that maybe resources will come and save us, never gonna happen for most countries because there just aren't enough resources anymore compared to the population size. Um, copper, we all need copper and cobalt, right? It's gonna be the EV revolution. It's gonna make a huge difference to Zambia and Congo. Mm. Zambia exports $500 per person a year. Congo, about $150, $200. You could double the price of copper. You could quadruple the price of copper. If you do anything more than that, we've got a world recession and the price of copper is going to fall. But this isn't going to make Congo rich. And you can see that in oil as well. This is oil exports per 1,000 people. Let's take Africa's biggest oil exporter, Nigeria. Five barrels per thousand people. It works out as about dollar fifty a week per person. You wouldn't even buy your cup of coffee. It's fine if you're Kuwait or Qatar. You've got more oil than, oh, but it's not gonna 
make you rich in big population countries. So I'm very close to the end. So what do governments do? Governments don't know this. Governments don't understand why their interest rates are so high. I've had so many debates with central banks. Why are your interest rates so high? They asked me to go and find out from the banks. Why do the banks in Tanzania charge such high interest rates? I've now worked it out. So the governments don't know this. So what do they do when their people say, why aren't you growing as fast as China? Or let's say Vietnam to be more 2020s. Um, and, and the government say, okay, what we'll do is we'll borrow more money. We'll borrow money from abroad and the debt levels have soared in the last 10 years as a result. And that'll be the thing, we'll build infrastructure. But, but the cost of that infrastructure is just too high and the debt levels we've now taken on are extreme. So that's not really an option anymore in the 2020s. And the markets got super pessimistic on a load of African credits I look at and a few Asians as well. Um, well, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. And uh, it, 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 we're feeling a bit better at the moment only because the IMF has come in and given a huge amount of support. IMF is very helpful because they give low interest rate lending. Um, so I, I found one solution for policymakers, um, it took a while. It's to do with currencies. You keep your currency cheap. You export more than you import, and then you finally have some dollars in your economy that you can use to invest. So the red countries are the ones which have a current account deficit. The black ones are the ones that have a current account surplus. They export more. <laughs> this is the size of your banking system. And this is the level of real interest rates. So really what you're looking for is around zero. Zero is ideal. This is where the cost of borrowing in real terms is basically zero. And what it shows you is if you're rich, the cost of your borrowing is nothing. It's zero, fantastic. And if you're poor, you can pay real interest rates as much as 8% a year for Uganda, Yemen, Mongolia, Tanzania. And the solution, so the only solution seems to be to run a current account surplus. On average, if I take all of those countries together, on average, current account deficit countries are paying the highest real interest rates in the world. Current account surplus countries are paying zero. So what have we seen in the last two years? As a few policymakers have begun to listen to Charlie Robertson on this, is we've seen currencies come down from massively overvalued rates in Egypt. You don't have to understand this chart too much, but we've now got currency in Nigeria, which is 40% cheap, insanely cheap. Yeah, everything about investing anywhere. <clears throat> Today, Nigeria is one of the most tempting for now. Egypt um, and Ghana, 28% cheap. These are really, really, really cheap currencies. They, they should help these countries reduce the cost of borrowing, give them some money to invest. Long run, you want your currency to strengthen over time, be in Asia, be an industrializing story. If you're not an industrializing story, it's at best flat, and at worst, it's boom, bust, boom, bust, as any Egyptian or Nigerian will tell you. Um, the only time to get really excited by markets like Nigeria or Egypt is, is today. And they're like extra and extra cheap. So this is this is uh, there are opportunities, um, and I do try and encourage investors to look at this. Um, I'm basically at the end. I am at the end. This is the last thing, which is a little bit more about markets, but maybe is relevant to you guys anyway. Um, which is the dollar really matters for flows of cash to emerging markets or not, frontier to Africa to anyone. When the dollar, which is the grey line is weak, so high up, then people put loads of money into emerging markets. And they did it in the early 80s. They did it again in the early 90s. They did it again in the 2000s. And, and when the dollar is stronger, they hate emerging markets. So if you go back to the year 2000, we loved America. America had tech companies that nobody else had. And, and Asia had just had uh, the Asian crisis. It was a disaster. Crony capitalism was never going to work in Korea because their governance was so bad. Let's talk about why nation is failing. Anyway, this is Korea. 
not doing very well. And this is America doing fantastic. Actually, it was totally the wrong place to put your money. You needed to put your money to emerging markets because for the next 10 years, emerging markets massively outperformed America, which had its own global financial crisis. So what do you do after the global financial crisis? Do you invest in China and, and, and Russia? Gazprom, biggest energy company in the world. It's amazing. They've got the young people. This is where you should put your money. Or do you put your money in bankrupt America, which has just given the world the worst financial crisis it's seen in 100 years? Of course, the answer is put your money to America. <laughs> so where are we today? Today, Nvidia is where it's at. China is going into property disaster. Game over for emerging markets. Don't ever put your career or time in emerging. Just go to America and work in tech in San Francisco. That's what markets are telling you today. It's not change. It always changes. And, uh, and when it does, the countries that I care about the most, the hopeless continent 20 years ago, the booming continent 10 years ago, now the continent that no one wants to put any money in is going to be a, a bit of a winner. But the countries that will win the most, Morocco, Kenya in five years' time, and others who then adopt some of these policy shifts. So I'm really going to stop there, because otherwise I'm going to kind of overrun. What you've got then is uh, one last, actually, yeah, last thing, last thing. This is, um, it's pretty basic about this line. Oh, and Marx. Oh yeah, well, does demolish Marxism. I said I'd demolish why nations fail, I also demolish Marxism. What Marx didn't understand in 1848 was that people would stop having six kids. He knew that you were going to keep on having six kids. There's going to be more and more and more people. The amount of capital in the economy wasn't going to grow because there was no the capital GDP growth in Europe in the 19th century of any size. So savings weren't going to grow. More and more people. Revolution. What he didn't understand is that my great grandparents would have three kids instead of seven. And when they did, the middle class began to grow. Savings began to grow. And everybody was then invested in the system. They're not invested in the system in Mali today, and that's why we have coups in Mali. But they are invested in the system when the fertility rate is below three. So Marx failed to forecast fertility decline. And let's come down to this last line. Up till now, we've always needed manufacturing and industrialization to take off. That's what's worked. We can see it's worked everywhere. Unless you're lucky enough to be lots of beaches and no people like Seychelles. It's about manufacturing. But tech and broadband and services and me buying a service from a Kenyan is now possible. And because of COVID, in a way, it's helped even made it more acceptable. And then you don't need a port. You don't need a good road. You don't need all of the infrastructure that costs billions and billions of dollars. You just need one broadband cable. And a solar panel on your roof that you bought from China. So potentially, we could get growth at, at higher fertility rates, with less savings required, and we can start to get that high per capita GDP growth from tech, I hope so. And I hope then that my book is entirely wrong. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm gonna stop. Um, thank you very much for that, Charlie. That was really thought-provoking. Um, I guess we have what about 30 minutes, 35 minutes? Yeah, Who has a question? I have one if no one people want to wait, and I have a few, but Naomi, right in the back, right there. Can you ask people to introduce themselves when they? Yes, to introduce yourself. Why are you here? And okay. what capacity? Um, my name is Aya. I'm originally Lebanese, but I grew up all my life in Nigeria. So, perfect. <laughs> um, I had a question about fertility rates because. What does that mean for the aging population? Like we're seeing now, Japan, China, etc. Because in the short term, yes, maybe it makes sense to have less children, and that might help us grow now. But then after, what happens when you have an aging population? Now we're seeing a lot of European countries, like the UK, exporting, um, importing, sorry, like migrant workers to come and do those jobs that we don't have enough population to do. So when we're now recommending to countries in Africa, etc., to have less children, then who will do those like? manual labor like we see in China and how China is trying to boost their their birth rate, etc. after one child policy and they're yeah. facing the consequences. So what does that mean well, in the long term? 
<clears throat> first thing, what we do know is going to happen is you will use tech to try and replace the workers. So the Japanese don't really want foreigners in their country, so they do massive amounts of robots. Uh, Singapore, China, and uh, Japan, I think, have got the highest number of robots per person. So they will do that. That will happen to some extent. We also know from Japan that the data sample is tiny. There's too few countries at this end of the story, but so far, 1% growth. It's pretty appalling. Um, so you can do the political thing of let's bring in the immigrants. But what we're seeing is a political backlash, sadly, against that. And what makes London so amazing is not something which is loved across the country. And uh, so there is a political backlash problem. So there's, 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 it's difficult for aging societies. My key message to, to the, the officials I'm speaking to in across Africa is get the fertility rate below three and almost immediately stop pushing for that decline. Because what we've seen is once you've gone through three, down to two, down to one and a half, in Taiwan it's now 0 0.9, you can't pull it up. It's like a plane going straight into the ground. So I, I, I think the we're trying to think about it in Europe today, but I, I think they're going to have a fantastic advantage in, in the continent, yeah. which is we'll be able to see what does work around the world. Like we can see what already works in terms of... The difficulty for me is if you don't get fertility below three, you are just going to have $1,000 per capita GDP forever. So... Saturated slightly, but not much. And, and that, so yes, there'll be an awful lot, you know, potentially 400 million people in Nigeria, but all on $1,000 per capita GDP. And that's, that won't be great, unfortunately. Um, so, I don't know why. Um, I was just to ask a question. My well, question is just be, give your name and. I'm Mike. Um, I'm doing my dissertation using your, your model. So I'll ask a question. Yes, yeah, so my question is basically this. Um, you argued that, or you said that, um, countries should um, basically value their currency so they can then export, export-driven growth, right? I actually put it slightly differently, which was we don't boost exports to Nigeria by devaluing the Naira, because all we're exporting is oil. Yes. We're not going to export more oil with the cheaper currency. It's still going to be priced in dollars. What we do is we force... Uh, or through economic necessity, Nigerian people to say, I'm going to stop buying the Chinese imports, which destroyed the cloth industry, by the way, in Nigeria, northern Nigeria. We're going to stop buying those imports because we literally can't afford them. We have to buy Nigerian-made clothes, and they will not be as good at first. But once you've sold 100 million of them to all the kids, and then again, eventually the quality will start to get better, and you move up from that. That's where I think the import substitution kind of story works through using a cheap currency to make yourself super competitive and not just in your own currency then, country, but also abroad. So yes, it wouldn't be about boosting the exports, just in case there you go. Okay, right. So my, my question basically is this. So if you if you go down that, um, that, that path, right, countries in Africa already have a lot of external debt that is priced in dollars. Yes. So then how would you go down that path if you have an external debt priced in dollars? That means you'd actually create a problem within your country where you have to then export exponentially more. more because your, your, your currency is cheaper. It so is, it's a cash only too. That's what it's all. So yes, it true. is. Um, and, we've, and we've seen countries tip over. With the devaluation we saw in Ghana, uh, we did see in Zambia, belatedly seen in Ethiopia, actually countries have tipped over in, in default. So that is a risk. We're okay now. That, where we're at, it's, it's bearable. Um, and, and Nigeria can manage its external debt. I know Egypt can manage it, thanks to the UAE saying it's $35 billion. Pays to have a good, rich friend. Um, so it, those, those countries look like they will be able to manage, but I agree, it's something to be wary of. Um, so far, the external debt portion, if it's, you can rely on the IMF to make the cost of that debt lower as well. That helps. Mm -hmm. But yes, it is. I would add that into the dissertation. This is a problem because. <laughs> Where are you doing this dissertation? So, I was going to ask a question. Yeah. You might show me your slides as well. Is it possible? Hey, of course. We have uh, got one there and then one there. Well, so, let's take one from online to keep oh, yeah, the crowd engaged. So, Harpen yeah. will ask a question on behalf of an online viewer. So, um, have a question. 
from Carlos for you. Um, from the chat on the first one. The first question is louder. Louder, okay. Um, on the currency point, yes, potentially good for net exports, but mega devaluations are very risky and potentially damaging in context of import contraction, where imports don't adjust quickly, leading to um, inflationary pressures, higher interest rates, etc. So the double edged sword and important matters here. The second question is Would you say that boosting energy infrastructure from Chinese lending and capital, for example, is unlikely to generate a drive to industrialize unless fertility rates fall quickly? Or is Ethiopia's recent example potentially viable for other high fertility countries, at least for a period of time? Fertility then. I slightly missed the second point, although it does raise an interesting point uh, relevant to North Africa, by the way, because North Africa is not growing as well as it should. It's not growing as well as East Asia has done. And I think the problem is if you use ILO numbers, International Labour Organization numbers, 20 to 25 percent of women in Morocco are in the, the labour force. East Africa, by the way, is 75%. East Africa, when it gets there, is going to be like, fantastic. East Asia, 75%. So basically everyone who can work is pretty well working. You never get more than about 80% anywhere, for men or women. Um, so, so that issue of, of women being brought into the workforce is hugely important. And I, and I think it's why Morocco is only growing at three or four most years, and it should be growing at five or six. Um, there was a previous point which I've, I got distracted by myself. Um, so, on the second question, yeah. you say that boosting energy infrastructure ah. from Chinese lending. Well, the trouble is the Chinese didn't do this. So, I, th I think the fundamental problem with China was that they saw their boom take off. They equally didn't say the one child policy gave us a massive glut of savings, which meant interest rates were 1%, which meant that we could create jobs, create infrastructure, do everything all at the same time, and lend a trillion dollars on the Belt Road. They didn't see that as the cause. It was Deng Xiaoping saying, it doesn't matter if your cat is black or white, as long as they catch mice, you know, we are, we're gonna just, we've got the right ideas. I, they attributed a bit too much to their own clever policies and not enough to just having cheap money. So what they did was say, okay, we now have cheap money. What's working for us in China? Oh, it's railways. We've got railways going from the coastal region inland. We've got all these high-speed railways. We've got vast amounts of buildings. And, and look, our economy's booming. So what Africa needs is uh, railways. So the standard gauge railway built in Kenya, $5 billion of Chinese money, the, the, the railway Djibouti to, to, to Addis, billions of dollars. And that hasn't created jobs. It hasn't created factories. It hasn't earned any dollars. That didn't matter in China because they had all these factories as well, so they were doing great anyway. So I think a little bit too much Chinese money has gone into transport, which is never the first thing the companies say is a problem. If there's a problem in your economy, it's always energy, electricity first, transportation second. The Chinese didn't quite get that. Having said all of that, the Chinese are delivering cheapest forms of electricity we're ever going to see. And I was just hearing from a guy who's advising Ghana's vice president in the election, the upcoming election, that Chinese companies won't sign five-year power purchase agreements anymore. And the reason they won't do it is because in five years' time, the cost of power is going to fall so much because battery storage prices are going to go down 80% in the next five years. As a result, we we'll only use solar power. We won't use anything else because we'll be able to store that energy super cheaply in five years' time to be transformational. So the cost of energy, which is such a big issue, suddenly gets much, much cheaper. So in that regard, what China's done through innovation, cheap finance, mass investment to deliver us very, very cheap power, that could be game-changing too. Again, crossing fingers on. Anything to prove my book wrong, good. <laughs> um, anyway, that was the, I'll just show the power slide again. Um, I may have still missed the point about the, the lady, but nonetheless, perhaps we should go back to the two questions in the room. So I saw your hand first, I'll come back to you and then three or four. Uh, hi, my name's Will, I'm one of the six former students that Charlie made guests. Which country would be... Um... Sorry? 
Richards, that was like six years ago. Dave um, <laughs> Manasseh. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask what do you think about, I guess, big environmental movement, ESG? So, you know, green bonds are given out to these countries and sometimes have a way to get cheaper financing. And yet, you know, China did the grocery nice green solar panels, they grew with bloody coal power panels. And yet, three and a half billion was just not just, it was a year or two ago now, rejected from Botswana because they wanted to build the coal power plants. It was rejected. Yeah. They said, we won't give you that money because it's too dirty. Would you, if you were advising an African government, say, would you have a bone to pick with the environmentalists, you personally? I No, I just, I think there's a definitive case. You've got to have base low power. Everyone in the power sector tells me this. You've got to have reliable power that works all the time. So Zambia, which has been dependent on hydropower for decades, is just building another power, coal power plant right now because we just had a drought. And as a result, they've got no power. And as a result, they're having to import power from South Africa, which uses coal. ESCOM, is it ESCOM? No, it's not ESCOM. What am I thinking about? Sassel. Sassel manages to turn coal or something into energy. It's, it's the most, there's more carbon emissions out of one square kilometre of South Africa because of this one company called Sassel than anywhere else on the planet. Anyway, so Zambia is buying coal power from South Africa because it's a hydro problem. So I think you have to have a base load power. The hope is that in five years' time, as I said, solar is so cheap that you can afford to have three times the solar you need. So even if it's cloudy, you store the power. But today, no, that doesn't work. So today, we do need more power. And even if it's... The, the, the carbon emissions per person in sub-Saharan average about 0.1 carbon ton per person, maybe 0.2. UK is the best in Europe at four and a half tons of carbon. The Americans do 17 tons of carbon per person. There is no carbon emissions coming out of most of Africa. South Africa is an honorable exception. So I, I think it's justifiable to have a bit of base low power. That's based on the Western investors disagree with you and on. The British government disagrees. They will not fund it. So BII, very good company, uh, British government funded, won't finance anything other than renewables because that's what the, the media. OK. There were four people here. So I don't know the order in which. I'll, let's take the lady first. Um, David, uh, so Rebecca Savile, my first degree is geography, but I'm currently reading for PhD in economics at SARS. So given global temperature is already about one and a half degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, and that is the level at which science says is safe. Anything after that mm -hmm. is dangerous. Is it totally reckless to pursue economic growth? Much bigger question than I'm asking here. But <laughs> I mean, it's a really, it's, I, I think if it helps reduce child mortality, if it gives people the opportunity to, to use their brains and in innovation, I think the whole, I used to think George W. Bush was mad 20 years ago when he said, technology is going to solve our problems. But I hope it does. And at the moment, what we've got is a situation where there's about half a billion people in Africa whose educational ability to tell us there's Einsteins in Africa that we don't know about because they're illiterate. And they, they have the ideas that will be able to sort out a whole chunk of problems and give us the innovation I hope gives us growth without rising temperatures. So you wouldn't subscribe to the view that to believe you can have infinite growth on a finite planet, you have to be either a fool or an economist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> totally <laughs> subscribed to that. <laughs> You've got me. Um, no, you have got me. I'm on that. Yes. I, I keep my... I'm only trying to solve global poverty. You've got bigger ambitions. I'm not that... But if in, global, in solving global po poverty in this room, you actually create more poverty than you solve, because, I mean, some of the predictions on climate change is that global population will be half a billion people. I still think that if I'm looking at where is the pollution problem, it's America with 17 tons of carbon it, per person. It's very strongly correlated with affluence, and you're trying to make people more affluent. It's not that strongly correlated, because in the UK it's four. We're not that much poorer than the Americans. It so we can we calculate it. We import when we shut down our steel industry, we reduced our carbon emissions. We import steel, we blame China for the emissions. Fair point. But 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, no, no, no. There are other people. <laughs> okay. There's a gentleman in the back who, who's behind his hand up. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. With uh, a yeah. Um, my name is Wilson Arimabora. I just uh, submitted my PhD thesis at SOAS uh, Economics and I worked on structural transformation industrialization. Well, my question is Is the problem really about uh, this high fertility rate or is it that the economy is not growing fast enough? Um, to be able to raise per capita income. And the reason why I say I'm from Nigeria and- <laughs> Which yeah. bet? Which bet? Um, from Lagos. Yeah, literally. And I actually follow you because I, I came here because of your, your tweet about this, this event. Um, so a lot of um, fast moving consumer companies have come to Nigeria, came to Nigeria in the 2000s, um, trying to leverage on that growing large population, large market. Um, but what, what we've seen in the last decade is almost like a reversal in terms of policy and growth and all of that. So the question really is, are we not, the, the problem is we're not growing fast enough, um, in my view, rather than blaming it on the population itself. But I totally agree. And the cause, the, the reasoning for that is because you cannot have the savings you need to grow fast enough. You, you're probably, I don't know, you're going to have two or three brothers and sisters, probably. And when you have kids, you'll probably have two, would be my guess. And so your kids will have a completely different experience. But that, that lack of savings that's cascaded down the generations is why you can't grow fast enough. So what you do have is, is Guinness can sell the same cans of Guinness at the same price to more and more people. What they can't do is sell you Guinness Premium because we're not going to get the per capita GDP growth. They're not going to move up the value added curve. They're not going to have the extra income. I mean, there'll be a little bit, but it's so slow. So that's the difficulty. Yes, there's big markets, but the markets are in the same products at the same low level of income. There'll be more people to sell to, but not higher incomes. And that's the difficulty, I think, um, that I was trying to, to get out here. There was a question, Liz. Yeah. Um, I've got three questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, not on electricity, but then. And who are you? Uh, yeah, I, I'm Galton. Uh, I'm a PG student in development study, global development. So I see. I'm from India. Uh, so uh, in India, like you mentioned in the graph, the literacy rate has improved, uh, but this says nothing about the quality of education in the country. Very good point. Uh, yeah, because uh, and employability of the youth has been cited by the corporates within the country over and over again as a reason why there aren't jobs. Um, and second question, I'll just give you hey, no, right, second right. question is again, uh, since I've mentioned the jobs thing, uh, we there's a whole narrative about the demographic dividend in the country, and you've pointed out about how there's a lot of people in the working age population, theoretically perfect for takeoff. Uh, but at the same time, we have an issue of no jobs. Uh, the economy is going through what is characterized as jobless growth. And because of that, there is a risk that, that a, a lot, large population of young working age people without jobs could be a big cross. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the final question is on fertility. Yes, um, uh, uh, one issue with India is, is there is a risk of aggregation. There's a huge amount of variation within the country. Like Bihar is yeah, yeah, about three, yeah. actually it was 1.4. Uh, but beyond that, uh, when there is such a lot of pressure to maintain fiscal deficits, for governments to not spend on education and health, what do we do? How do you actually... Uh, Biggest problem. I'm right now we're seeing a whole load of governments in default, yeah. and, and I'm selling them whatever you do, carry on funding education. Mm. But because in 20 years' time, that's the only thing that's going to get you out of this repeat pattern of default and disaster. Um, very, very difficult. On, on the, the variation with India, absolutely right. Um, the state, I think 80 to 90 percent of women who are employed in uh, industry is in one state in the south where they have bothered to educate women quite well and um, part of india's problem uh is that 34 percent i think it's 34 percent female employment is less than saudi arabia saudi arabia has done a better job of getting women into the workforce than india because women haven't been given across india the education opportunities they have so 
That problem, though, of low income and a lack of jobs, I mean, I haven't got India here annoyingly, but it, it doesn't really matter. What we see at this point, India is not that different from Indonesia. What we're seeing is millions of more working age people coming into the workforce every year. How can you possibly create the jobs for them? The well paid jobs. You can't. Per capita GDP stays low for 20 yeah. to 30 years after the demographic dividend, because you've got all of these people coming to the workforce. And the consequence of that is the rise of social democracy in Europe in the 1870s. Why did we create a Labour Party in the UK in the 1900s? Why did we legalise trade unions? Because actually people start to get cross. It takes such a long time for your income to pick up. It has to basically, I think, for the incomes to really take off, you've got to cap out on this growth of the, of the labour market. And at that point, labour starts to earn some pricing power. And at that point, people start to get a little bit happier. Question from uh, online. It's a problem. It's going to be a problem for decades. <laughs> uh, go to an online question. Yes. Yes. We have a question from Vinny Kalindango. What does liberty fall mean to the situation and that this is meant to be a fundamental issue in Pakistan? Are you saying that similar corruption within the leadership is not a significant obligation? And the second question is uh, how do you factor in the impact of war on the economic indicators? Your reviewing such as child mortality and education. I'm thinking about the immediate and long term impacts on economic growth and development in Palestine that have been considered. Um, excellent questions. The first one is, um, sorry, the visionary leadership is amazing, but we cannot, we cannot hold out for visionary leadership because it's so rare to have a Lee Kuan Yew say in the 1960s, I'm going to have uncorrupt government, I'm going to sort out education, I'm going to get fertility rates down, all of which he did. It, it just, he's a, he's a, of a legend, not, not you know, a huge Democrat necessarily, but he was a bit of a legend on development. We can't rely on that, and we don't need to rely on that, because Taiwan did pretty well the same job, and so did Hong Kong, and so did Korea, and since then, Vietnam, Philippines. Everyone has actually followed the same prescriptions, is, is heading in the rain, same direction. So it would be lovely if we had visionary leadership. We just have to assume that our leadership we will, we will, we cannot like our leadership in Nigeria because there's almost nothing they can do to make people happy. They haven't got any savings. They can't produce good infrastructure because they haven't got any money. They can't create jobs because there isn't any money. They can't make a difference on education that will transform this economy for 10 years and they'll be out of power by the time. People praise India's Modi now. Say, look at Modi, he's done such a great job in India. No, no, no. Some bloke 30 years ago in India sorted out education. Now, 25 years later, India's reaping the benefits of that, and Modi's there saying, ah, this is all me. It's not true. It's not true. I mean, he's, he's a good guy. He's not screwing it up, and that's important. But you do get Argentina, Venezuela. You do get leaders to screw it up. But in the main, I don't think we have to hold out for visionary leadership. Uh, but this is you as leading with him? Some women should be allowed to ask questions. I'll <laughs> ask a question. So I'm Naomi. I work here in the SOAS Development Studies Department. Um, thank you. This was really interesting. I have a couple of questions. I'm going to be long. One is, what is your method? Do you have any theory or do you just rummage around in data until patterns emerge? Uh, second is about this picking up this point, this very good question about visionary leadership. You, you said somewhere in your talk that politics can really screw things up, but you've never suggested that politics, and politics is different from visionary leadership, that politics actually can be the thing that makes it all kick off, as in Vietnam, a particular kind of politics. And then um, I'm kind of curious about, you know, you talked about going to African governments and giving them suggestions, giving them advice. I'm, I'm interested to know how they receive all of this. What do they say when, when you go to meet the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Energy or whoever it might be? The last one I met said, I don't want to wait 15 years. <laughs> Which is what I was telling him his country was going to need before it could really take off. And that's great. That's what I want to see. But I, what, I, what I want to see is policymakers recognising what they can work with. So it's not 
Where is it? Again, I do love Nigeria. So this is not personal against Tanubu, but he's got, you know, they, they talk about a trillion dollar economy by 2030. It's never going to happen. So let's not fantasize about that. Let's focus on what we can do in five to 10 years. And if we're going to take on debt, where should that debt be focused on, which is primarily export generating dollars, would be my argument. Just so that people are at least in the right realm. I, I haven't got the answers on that, all the best ways to do it, but at least to be in the right realm and not to be in fantasy land. That's what I'm uh, trying to do. On the, on the rem I rummage around in the data and then I go to the theories. The amount of times I've started reading up on a, I wonder why this matters or interest rates. And then I find out that somebody's already written this in the fifties. And then there's been counter arguments in the seventies. And I go down a rabbit hole of LSE library kind of burrowing for about two weeks. And then I was like, and then I try and modernize. Basically all I'm trying to do is modernize a whole load of theories that have been largely forgotten. I was in Thailand last month and the, uh, I discovered that they had a general in Thailand in the 1980s, I didn't know this, who said, if you have more than two kids, you're gonna be poor. So what happened? Thai people listened to him, fertility rate fell, they industrialized, they export loads of cars, they got considerably richer. They've gone down too far down the fertility thing the other way now. They really are. They really have got old before they've got properly rich. So Thailand's actually a really interesting case example of going too far on this. But, but the point is, is that we already knew this in the 80s. Bangladesh knew this in the 80s. They knew about fertility issues. And it's just it's it's fascinating. Some general said that he had he, he'd read, he'd read, presumably. Someone had told him. So this was a good thing. And it worked. It worked. Thailand became immensely better off. Much better off than, say, Myanmar. All the people from Myanmar are moving to Thailand because it's a better country to live in. And they're saying, you know what, in Thailand, yes, we're too old. You know, the average age in Thailand is older than the UK now. If you want to go hang out with party, you know, hit people, you come to England now if you're a Thai. Not, not the other way around. But, but they've just said, we can just bring in as many people from Laos and Myanmar as possible. And we'll be fine. But anyway, uh, the more important thing is that these ideas get forgotten. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd rediscover them in my ignorance after I'm giving the data. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Alan. I'm a PhD student in the Development Studies Department here at the So I think your whole premise is that fertility leads to higher savings, leads to investment. So growth, right? So you're saying savings leads to investment, but this has been disputed a lot. As investment comes first, then savings. The examples that you cited about South Korea, Vietnam, and places like that, where they said that savings is what drove investment. But there's been examples that have been shown that actually investment came first and savings. So what would what, what you sort of say to that? Because I, you're, you're, what is that right? Yeah, yeah, but I just don't see it in the data. I don't see a country with high fertility that's ever got rich. Ever. Never happened. So uh, you can have the investment if you're a Kuwait uh, or Bahrain or UAE and you've got oil in the 60s. You know, that's where yeah, the investment I, I comes from. That, but, um, you're showing a correlation between yeah, I fertility don't, and investment. I don't but see you're, the data. You're, 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 the direction you're going is. Fertility, savings, and investment. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because that's that's what I see working. Don't see it working the other way. The high investment countries, including India right now, are all in low fertility countries. There's nowhere that's high investment I can think of, except Mozambique, but that's just an energy thing. They've got no people, a few people, and massive energy. So Mozambique, it, you, that's, that's an exceptional story. But you see it on the uh, bank deposits data as well, actually. It's, it's, a, it's a very... Um, yeah, no, there it is. That, that's a high investment story, but that's purely because all those horrible mining companies are coming in and pouring money into the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, this gentleman here has a question. Yes, um, and then over here. Okay. I'm Mark. You know, I also spend a lot of my time looking at African economies, but with more of a short term perspective and more specific about that. So, my question is about industrialization. I mean, I saw. And, you know, it's not the kind of job factories that it used to be. I saw a photo of an autos factory in, in South Africa, and there were more robots in the photo than workers, and the workers looked, you know, a bit like these engineers. And so I understand what I also goes to what Colton says that the uh, literacy has become a minimum level, and I understand that you know that's the time series you have, which has you know 
after a long time series availability of data and literacy can still be seen probably overall literacy as a kind of best proxy available proxy for overall education level but for this industrial industrialization happen you is a 60 70 percent do you see that level rising over time because um like it, it raises yeah. the same similar question to what somebody else said about the quality of education as yeah, well exactly. um, so I'll, I'll tie them both in you're right absolutely right um, i use the literacy figures because i could literally go back even to 15th century holland why was 15th century holland so successful 16th century or 15th century venice in italian states literacy again plays a key role well, the jewish kind of diaspora has always done quite well because boys had to learn to read the torah so which always gave Jewish community a better literacy rate, which then helped them dominate Romanian retail in the 1900s because they were literate. Anyway, um, I, I agree. The quality of education is a big problem. So I think the, the study that the, uh, the World Bank did showed that if you have 18 years of education in Singapore, you've got 18 years of education. If you've got 18 years of education in the UK, you've got 16 years of education because two years are in the pub. And if you're in South Africa, 18 years of education is 11 years. No wonder South Africa doesn't quite fit my model. I mean, it's just, it's, you no, know, the quality issue is a, is a problem. Uh, again, it gets into the thickets of the, getting the education policy right is not my expertise. Do you, just, this, do you still have the, I mean, proxy as a general proxy, the best available proxy? Do you see that line uh, rising over time as, uh, as manufacturing becomes more skills intensive? I think the, the point here is that you can, that, that robots are not worth using for basic cheap textiles. That's been the, the lesson so far. I mean, they may end up becoming so cheap. Um, so you can still get from your subsistence $100 a month to your lowly paid $300 a month in a horrible textile mill, tripling your wages. You can still do that with a pretty modest educational level. Whether you then get stuck in the middle income trap, that becomes the big issue. Have you got enough quality of education? I was talking to Jonathan before about Brazil. Brazil might now be finally educating enough at a higher level to get out of the middle income trap, which is quite an interesting shift. But I do I look at secondary school, and that does give a little bit new, more nuance as well um, on this question. Oh, yeah. um, so, uh, quick point and then a quick question. Um, Who are you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, I'm Tanya. I'm a, a postgrad student in the economics department here at SOAS. Um, quick point that I wanted to make. So when we're talking about female employment in India, there's a lot of informal employment of women in India, which doesn't capture um, that probably factors in. Uh, and then the question that I wanted to ask is when we talk about lowering child mortality as a way of like feeding to increase infertility rate, um, isn't there an issue? Is does this create a circular problem with like lack of infrastructure? So already, you know, high poverty levels is already poor infrastructure. Um, the healthcare may not be very good. Um, that might be because they lack electricity and education literacy levels. How do you break that cycle? I think it's I. I'm not very good on. Uh, I'm not very good at lots of things actually, but I'm not very good at working out how we sort out the problems um, here. As if I, I just don't know. I and mean, obviously you educate people, but you know, what do you do for the 20, 30 years in between? I had a fantastic debate with um, Liberia's former Minister of Investment and Infrastructure, um, Guido Moore. He works at the Center for Global Development now in Washington. He was just saying, Charlie, it's all very well you saying we ought to be focusing on uh, you know, child mortality, but do you want the electricity to be on in the hospital to save the kids' lives, or do you want it to be on in, in the school so that they can learn to read? That's so, oh, proof. And then, and then what about the security issue? What about if you've got somebody like charging around with a gun and blowing up the school in, in Borno? You've got to sort out security first. So suddenly you're in the situation where you've got to spend money on security. You've got to spend money on the schools. You've got to spend money on education. This is where I'm, I paid people to come in and sort it out because the private sector really isn't likely to sort out the problems of extremely low income people but not have profit in it. Where the private sector can come in and say, oh no, hold on, there's some opportunities here and here. Um, so I, I haven't got the answer to that one. Yeah. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Right, it's, it's a fair point. And, and good point also about the, the women in the informal economy. I, the only thing is I hear that everywhere. The Egyptians tell me I'm talking nonsense with ILO numbers. It's not 20% of women working, every bloody woman's working. And in the informal economy, we're not just talking about at home. Um, I don't know what I can do with the data. But I accept the point that it could be different from what figure say. Charlie, I have a question. Um, it's about kind of what's causing what. I mean, because I think there's things that there's there's a lot of correlation going on. Isn't that true? true? That's the so what, one of the when I think of Latin America, I think of Brazil, but also the region generally. You had a region that was industrializing more than East Asia up to a point to the 60s and 70s. You had fertility declining. And when it's, so it's Achilles heel was that it didn't run trade surpluses. It didn't translate high investment savings rates. It always had that as an Achilles heel. And it didn't have massive exports. It did a lot of import substitution. It was very closed. But a lot of that really, to me, is not so much about fertility. It did create a lot of electricity generation. It was certainly doing better than East Asia, and then it had a debt crisis, and then it sort of collapsed. And so, based on your parameters, uh, I'm, was, I'm not sure I see... It was the fertility. So there was only two countries in 1970 that had a fertility rate below three in South America. They were Uruguay and Chile, right. which then became the two most successful economies in South America. And in the 1980s, that high fertility rate is why Latin America defaulted to money. So they, they, commodities went up, they said we can go and borrow as much money as we like because the Americans were desperate to lend at the time. And, and the fertility rate meant they didn't have the domestic savings. So they, they took all that debt on. Since then, the fertility rates dropped below three everywhere. Uh, mm. And Brazil hasn't issued a net dollar of extra sovereign debt, of government debt in dollars in 12 years or 15 years. They haven't issued right any dollar. It's amazing. They just don't need to. I get that point. But the point is, in Latin America's own history, yes, you had a very successful industrialization up until the 60s and 70s, and its fertility rate was declining relative to what it used to be. And yet, according to those parameters, it should have not been moving in a growth collapse direction, which it eventually did. I think the fertility rate was the problem in the 70s or 80s. However, what I've never answered well, was fertility why... in the 70s and 80s less than it was in the 40s? No, no, I don't know why in the 60s it was so good. The Mexican Industrial Revolution in the 50s and 60s was... I still need to learn about that. Um, so, but I think, yes, it's Latin America is very interesting. Question in the back, gentlemen. Hi, my name is Cameron. I'm Soas Salam from the Learn Studies. Um, I wanted to touch on the, um, so this idea of the literacy rates, is it, is it a homogenous thing for a country? So, so I've done a bit of work in Guatemala, and when we're looking at like, you know, literacy rates, the Spanish, but there's also a lot of mine communities, so like, people in that area, how, how does does it come as one homogenous improvement of literacy rates or does the indigenous factors, are they also important in that way? I don't know about indigenous, I, I, if I misunderstand your question, do, do ask me again, but it doesn't matter what language you're literally yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's farming is hard work yeah. and it can be in any language you like, but as long as you can read and write, farming is hard work, you're counted as literate. There's not many more sentences than that. It's like four more sentences than that, and you, you pass the threshold. We're not talking a high threshold. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't seem to manage the language. We have a, time for a couple of questions in the back, and then one online. Hi, my name's Noor. I'm a first year global development student. And my question kind of goes with the, with the data that you were presenting. I don't need to make Nigeria the center of everything, but when you had said Nigeria exports five barrels of oil per capita a day. A thousand people. Yes, yeah. and it, do, it doesn't necessarily consider the 430,000 barrels that are stolen a day. Mm. And so, or when we're talking about Congo and looking at like the, the linear line of growth, we don't talk about the 30 year humanitarian conflict and genocide in space. And so how far 
do these different variables play when you think of when you're analyzing this data and presenting it? They, I mean, I, in a way, they fit into the corruption thing. I mean, the, the whole hundred, how many hundreds of thousands are stolen? We know a lot is stolen in Nigeria. It would change into six barrels per thousand people, maybe seven, instead of 300 in the Gulf states. And that difference on a daily basis, the, the extra barrel, sadly, the way you make money in Nigeria in oil is to be the guy in charge of the two million barrels. You try and spread it out over 220 million people, it's just not gonna, it doesn't work. So, I, I, you know, all matters, but it's not, it's not a game changing thing, I think. If you've got the right governance, if you've got the guy who, I, I had a very good argument about, uh, let's call it an unnamed <laughs> country in, in, in sub saharan it's true for very many. If you didn't have corruption, money getting stolen, oil getting stolen, there wouldn't be any budget deficits because that's probably how much is getting stolen. The entire budget deficit of most countries is getting stolen. So then what would happen if there's no budget deficit? The government wouldn't be borrowing. If the government's not borrowing, maybe interest rates wouldn't be 25% anymore. Maybe they'd be 20, maybe they'd be 15%. And maybe then you get a bit more growth, a bit more jobs being created and all the rest. So it, it in an ideal world, we'd have a and no corruption, no conflict. Somebody asked a question about conflict. I didn't really answer that one. It's just, no, it completely ruins the story for like decades. It's, this is the Sri Lanka problem with Lebanon problem. Um, okay, I think the last question is going to be an online one from Hubbard. Another question from uh, Fakhar Aurora. Stellar presentation. Could you shed some light on whether any African country could truly benefit from the next commodity super cycle? I'm curious, especially given the uncertainty around when this might happen with China's economy. I mean, so I, I explain how you're not going to get super rich in Congo because there's just too many people, or, or Zambia. However, I've also said you we need a current account surplus. And if you get a current account surplus, the whole level of interest rates in your country goes down. So if the value of your exports in Zambia goes up 50% because the copper price goes to you know, up 50%. All gone with it. it will help. It will help. It helps them get to that current account surplus, that excess of dollars that gives them money to invest. So they do become, Zambia is a, is a, is, should be a bit of a winner. Um, and from where we're at, places like Guinea might do better off the back of aluminium and stuff. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a relative call. Basically, the, the smaller the country in population size, the more potential it is for, for commodities to make a difference. Um, and when you get really big, it just gets much, much harder to hope that the that, that commodities are going to make a difference. Um, we stop there. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, on, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you for a really stimulating <laughs> Next one, you want to announce? No. Yeah, the mm -hmm. seminar will be on the 14th of uh, November. So that's the last one. Thanks. Next